All right, can, is this on, Carrie? Can you hear me? Okay. All right, well, we have two sessions uh, today. Um, one, the first one is Christian Moral Living, and, uh, and it's C13. And, and you have an online version, or do they, or do they actually? Okay, so C13, and then um, C14 is uh, the Dignity of Life. And so we're going to talk a little bit about those. Um, I will do an opening prayer, but I'm going to incorporate that as part of uh, this, this session. So first, I want to open up with a reading from the book of Proverbs. This is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Do not forget my teaching. Take to heart my commands. For many days and years of life and peace will they bring you. Do not let love and fidelity forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and esteem before God and human beings. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. On your own intelligence do not rely. In all your ways be mindful of him, and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This will mean health for you, for your flesh and vigor for your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with first fruits of all your produce. Then will your barns be filled with plenty. With new wine your vats will overflow. The discipline of the Lord, my son, do not spurn. Do not disdain his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves as a father, the son he favors. So that's from the book of Proverbs. And so here's our opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we realize and we've experienced that many times we fall into the trap of learning on our own understanding of right and wrong. Sometimes we have even denied your presence or authority or the existence of any universal morality, thinking instead it's true or right for me. Other times we attempt to follow a path claiming to be moral or even Christian, when actuality it is not. People are people, Lord, and sometimes we fail to offer you a say in our daily choices. So we look to you tonight as we discuss this topic to be with us, to guide us, to help us become closer to you, to become close to the point where our decision making is based on your reflection of how you would perceive the situation. And we ask all these things in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so in Christian Moral Living, our objectives for this particular thing, there's really four objectives. Okay, first, the, one of the first things we want to make sure that we understand is that the moral law comes from God. Okay, the moral law comes from God. Um, realize that hu human freedom or free will does not imply moral autonomy. We're not allowed to make up things on our own. Um, free will, freedom, does not imply that autonomy. Um, number three, to accept that we are to form our consciences according to Christ's teachings, to the scripture, to the church, and to the writings of saints and theologians. So there's, our consciences just, there needs to be a guide, there needs to be a pathway to form our consciences. And realize that the ultimate goal of Christian moral living is not to just avoid sinning, which of course is always the goal, but to learn to live a life of love, to be able to love one another as he has loved us. So. <clears throat> So that's the, the goal. So what is conscience? Um, there, there is a specific definition they give, and um, 
moral conscience is present at the heart of a person, so it's present with inside, inside of us, and enjoins us at the appropriate moment to do good and to avoid evil, but it also uh, judges against particular choices that we have made. So um, uh, the choices uh, sometimes that we have made uh, are, uh, can be validated or substantiated by our moral conscience, right? So we, um, it, it guides us in that way. Um, and approving, approving those things that we did that were good, but denouncing those that were evil. Um, also, it gives us, the moral conscience gives us the ability, if an act occurs, to be able to make a judgment as toward the goodness or the evilness of that act. Okay, so that's in our moral conscience. So um, it's a... And by judgment, by using our judgment, we perceive and recognize the prescriptions of the divine law, the law that God has written in our hearts. So even if someone has never been exposed to, um, to really anything, there's, there's kind of like this natural law that exists, and there's a law that exists within our own hearts just because we were created in the image and likeness of God. Um, and there's something that triggers us. Well, that wasn't really right, was it? Or that, you know, or that was right. Or, you know, I need to step in here and stop that. And so that's that's our moral conscience that's capable of that. Um, so there, um, there are several different scriptures. But first of all, I wanted to talk about how do we make big decisions of our life? Any, anybody has purchased a house before or chose a school or um, decided to get married or was purchasing a car, made something big, some big decision in your life. How do you go about making those big decisions? What is your process? Is there a process or is it just... Well, I'll pick that one, you know. you know. Oftentimes, things that are really big, really important in our lives, we have a process. And sometimes it's more organized. For some people, it's very organized. They have spent years of research. They've got it down to the wire. They have it, you know, formatted. And some people, they're a little bit more carefree. But there's still a process when we're making big decisions. The moral life requires a process process as well, okay? The moral Christian morality requires uh, a process. Um, uh, there was a, a, one of the disciples um, asked how Jesus came to present himself to them and not to the rest of the world, and Jesus answered, and this is in John 14, chapter, I mean, chapter 14, verse 23, whoever loves me will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Jesus is saying that loving God, loving him is a way to welcome him into our hearts. That's one of the first starts of, of recognizing um, the, the morality in us is, is to be united with Christ. Um, and then we also have in Matthew um, chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. So just because we say we know who God is, and, and, but we don't act on that, we don't participate in his will, um, and Jesus, we call Jesus by name, only to say that we're Christian, but not live a life of a Christian life. Um, Jesus says um, he will not recognize us. Um, so how can we know God's will? I mean, obviously, there must be something that we have to do to know the will of God and, um, and to know what choices to make. So I was talking about those big choices uh, a, while, a while ago. Does anybody have any examples in their life, like when they're making a big choice that they want to share or anything like that? You don't have to. I'm just asking. Uh, 
There, um, in, in the handout, but it's gonna be on your online version, there's a thing called the STOP method for forming and informing your conscience. And so there's four different things, and it's STOP is the thing. It's called the STOP method. So search out the facts. Find out what is, what's true, what's right, what's wrong, uh, those kind of things. Search out the facts, and when you're, and this can be any decision that you can make. You can bring Jesus into that decision using the stop method. Think about the alternatives, okay? What would happen if I do this? What, what are the consequences of my actions? What things will get better? What things might get worse? What things might make me help my family what things might make it worse on my family. So um, like if you're making a big move across the country, you know, but everybody's rooted in one place, that might be something you need to do, but what are the consequences of that action? Consult others. So others is the third one. So search and out facts, think about alternatives, others to be consulted, um, and then other people that have um, that you respect, that have Christian values, that um, are knowledgeable about the topic that you're you're asking about, um, talk to them uh, about that. And then, I think the most important one, the P, pray, pray for guidance. So pray for guidance. Um, it's going back to others who be, should be consulted. I remember. Um, my oldest daughter, uh, she wanted to be uh, a film studies major. I'm a physician. I went high school, college, medical school. My wife's a physician. She went high school, college, medical school. That's all we know. We don't know anything else. So she's, and she's asking our opinions, and then we're like, really? We know nothing about film. You can't ask us about film. Go talk to people that are in film. Go talk to, you know, and there are people in, in this community who have some film experience or, or they have family members. And so it's like, you can't talk to us, you know. And then she goes through this whole process, becomes a film studies major, does well. And then when she graduates, she gets job offers in California um, and, and decent job offers. And she gets job offers in New Orleans. And she's like, well, I don't want to move there. <laughs> and I was like, that should have been part of your thought process. You know, <laughs> you know, we got to go where film is made, right? So big decisions require some, a little bit of planning. Um, I, I don't think anything is wasted. I think film will ultimately be used in her life. Um, and I think it, it may be a good thing. She happens to be in medical school now. And so maybe film will be part of that process. I don't know, but I, I don't think anything is wasted. It's just when we're making decisions, we need to think about these kind of things. Um, the next section in the, in the handout is following our conscience. Um, <clears throat> and remember, I told you what conscience was. So, and this is from Romans uh, chapter 2. They show that the demands of the law are written in their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. So the demands of the law is written in our hearts, and our conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even defend them on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge people's hidden works through Christ Jesus. So our actions will reflect how our, we are, or we're affected by what was written on our hearts and our conscience. Both of them come into play. Um, and in the catechism, it talks about the moral good consists in a man being moved to do the good, not only by his will, but also by his heart. It's an internal thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's Jesus lives within us. It's that internal consultation with Jesus. Um, so having a conscious and a free will does not imply a right to say or do everything. This freedom of free will um, is 
we can't do anything that we want just because we want to do it. There is a moral law that we violate and we violate our own freedom and become imprisoned within ourself um, when we disrupt the moral law, when we disrupt our neighbors, when we rebel against divine truth. So um, it's not a freedom to do whatever we want. Our freedom, our free will allows us to choose good and avoid sin, submitting ourselves to the ways of God. God created us right to be in that relationship with, with him. We were created to be in that relationship. Think about the first um, um, Adam and Eve, the first people. Um, God created them, and they were united with him in the beginning. Uh, God will not force us into faith. He offers it freely. He will not force us to be obedient to his will, but he desires the relationship. And when we are obedient to his will, we're in that relationship with him. Um, and this is also a quote, a section from the Catechism. There is no true freedom except in the service of what is good and just. The choice to disobey and do evil is an abuse of that freedom and leads us to become slaves to sin. So just think about the times that we rejected what we knew what was right. Then sometimes nothing major happens. Think about Adam and Eve. You know, it's like, well, this apple tastes good. It looks good. It's, I desire it. And they take the bite. And then something's changed. There's this separation between them and God. Then they become afraid of their, they become embarrassed of their, their bodies, which they were never embarrassed before. Then they're afraid of God. They have to hide themselves from God. Our Sin does that. Sin separates us from God and from each other. So um, when we abuse the freedom, um, it leads to slavery of sin. Um, there's a, a prayer um, and freedom and grace it, grace is not in the slightest way a rival of our freedom it's when this freedom accords us with a sense of what is true and good that God has put in our heart again the heart um, so and we, we get that experience most fully in prayer, in that discussion with God, when we unite ourselves to God in prayer. Um, and there was a little prayer that they offered. It says, Almighty and merciful God, in your goodness, take away from us all that is harmful, so that made ready both in mind and body, we may, be, we may freely accomplish your will. This is one of the opening prayers Actually, that father will say in, in a mass uh, for the 32nd Sunday in ordinary time. Um, but listen how beautiful again. Almighty and merciful God, in your goodness, take away from us all that is harmful, so that made ready both in mind and body, we may freely accomplish your will. Um, you know, we look at, we, we form our conscience um, by several different ways. Uh, look back to the, the Old Testament. How did the, the Jewish people um, make decisions or how, how were they guided in their decision, in forming their decisions? And, you know, they looked to the law of Moses, to the Ten Commandments. Um, so they looked to that, something that was given to them by God through um, Moses and that's how they helped form their decisions. Many laws were made to kind of fit those laws into their daily lives. And, um, and sometimes they deviated too far from the original law, but basically they were trying to form their conscience. It, we have examples in the early church that they do that in 1 Corinthians. We read about Paul responding to questions in the community um, um, that had written him and he says, now. Regarding the matters about which you wrote, is how he starts that. He's, um, 
So they wrote to him, and then he starts. So they consulted Paul. We can look to those saints that have gone before us. We can consult them in, through their writings, uh, through the writings of Scripture. We can go to um, the teachings of Jesus and the church directly, and we can go to families and friends to help us make formed and informed decisions. You know, Jesus came, he said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And he echoes a lot of what happens in the Old Testament. We talked about the, the Ten Commandments. Um, you, shall have, you shall not have other gods besides me. Um, you shall not uh, invoke the Lord's name in vain. Uh, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, honor your father and mother. You shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, bear false witness to your neighbor, shall not cover your neighbor, covet your neighbor's house um, and your neighbor's wife. So the Ten, ten Commandments. Jesus goes a step far, farther and he offers the Beatitudes, right? And the Beatitudes have a whole different level of, of meaning and how they affect us. It calls us to a higher standard. So Jesus calls us in the, in the Beatitudes to a higher standard. Anybody have examples? And he, he uses um, blessed. Uh, so blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed also means happy, so you can substitute that word. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom. And blessed are you when they insult and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward will be great in heaven. And thus they have prosecuted the, persecuted the prophets before you. So it calls us to a higher standard. What do you think if everybody though, I mean, just even without that higher standard, if every person in the world followed just the 10 commandments, what do you think this world would look like? I mean, think about it. A lot different than it is now, right? I mean, just, just um, thou shall not steal, thou shall not covet, thou shall not, you know, honor your father and mother. I mean, if we just did those ten things, how much better we would be. Um, and, you know, when we go to confession, um, through the sacrament of confession, we're forgiven of our sins, uh, one of the ways that we, we reflect on our sins is we go through the Ten Commandments to help us figure out what sins we've committed. You know? So um, again, Jesus uses a higher standard. So it says, uh, the, you, know, you, shall, um, you know, you shall not, um, I can't even think of the, the term, no. but even anger is, is bad. You know, it's, thou shall not kill. He says, I, I tell you, even if you're angry against your brother, that will be a sin against you, you know. And then if you go on further, the further you carry it, that's where it leads to, you know, to a hatred. And, um, and then the sin that's committed is, uh, could ultimately result in, in killing. Um, so it's, it's, Sin disrupt, disrupts our relationship with God and with each other. And in that disruption, we sometimes become comfortable with the sin that we're committed and then start guarding ourselves. And if people start saying things, then we lash out. You know, it's, it's a, it, and, and it traps us further and further and the sin becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So being able to lift that sin off of us uh, is is quite an amazing thing. It's, this is such a beautiful uh, and, and cleansing sacrament. Um, uh, you know, Jesus 
one of the things was on the seventh day, um, uh, you rest and to keep the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were very particular. They're, every time Jesus did a miracle on the Sabbath, he was not resting, you know, and, and Jesus kept saying, look, is it better to let someone suffer or be on the brink of death and not help them on the Sabbath or to restore their limb or to, to be with them in this kind of way or to touch them or to, to give them hope or to let them see or to let them hear? Is it better to do that than, than you, know, you know, to part of the Sabbath was to, to honor your relationship with God. It wasn't to take away from the good that can be done in our lives. Right. So, um, and then, so his, one of the things that his apostles were um, walking through a field of, of grain and they were picking the grain and eating it and it was on the Sabbath. And they said, you see, they're harvesting on the Sabbath, you know, <laughs> and Jesus says, you know, the Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. And that is why the Son of Man is even is Lord even of the Sabbath. So Jesus use, um, builds on what the Old Testament teaches and then in, in, in express and expands it further. We also look to the church. Um, Remember, the source of the authority for the church comes from Christ himself when he said to Peter, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And basically, when Christ communicated his divine power to Peter and the other apostles, he sent and sent them to teach to all nations his commandments, he constituted them as the authentic guardians and interpreters of the whole moral law. So, in these 2,000 years of history where the apostles have laid their hands on, you know, those to become bishops and then those to become, and throughout um, all these 2,000 2, plus years, um, and all the uh, teachings and authority and, and that was given them to, to entrust Jesus's will when he established the church here on earth, it would be a very serious matter to just neglect the teachings of the church without giving it some serious thought. Can we question it? Yes, we can question everything. But to just outright deny it because we just don't like it is, is a pretty serious thing to do. So we need to inform and form our conscience, okay? So, um, and not just to reject the teaching of the church. The church is here to help us get to heaven. It's not to hinder us. There's a reason why there are certain things um, laid out the way they are. And it's backed by 2,000 years of uh, tradition and theologians and gospel, you know, and, and scripture and, and it's built on and built on and built on. It's not something to just take lightly and to cast off as like, well, I don't believe in that, you know. Um, and we can't become, when we say we're Catholic, we're, we believe in all, everything. It's, it's a universal. Catholic means universal. But we believe in everything that the church teaches that comes from Christ and that's built upon what Christ has taught us, okay? So um, we can't say, well, yeah, I believe in all of this, but I think it's all right to have abortion because I think that's a person's choice. Then you're, you're taken away <laughs> from a, an essential teaching of the church and, you're, and how Catholic are we? If we're if we can pick and choose which things we like or dislike, so um, living like Christ. Um, and this is I'm going to read a passage from the Gospel of Matthew. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit upon His glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before Him. 
and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. A stranger and you welcomed me. Naked and you clothed me. Ill and you cared for me. In prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry? feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of these least brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill, and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or ill, or in prison, and not minister to your needs? And he will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do, which you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. He talks about, um, oftentimes we think of sins as something we do. Um, Jesus says there are sins that when we fail to do something that we know we should be doing. When we fail to act when someone is hungry or thirsty or naked or, or in prison. When we, when we don't help them, when we don't look out for each other, um, we're neglecting Christ. Uh, so it's not just things that we do, but it's also things um, that we fail to do. Um, I love the, the confidier and, that's said in Mass sometimes. Um, uh, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, and what I have done and what I have failed to do. It's such a beautiful prayer. And then it asks, of course, for all my brothers and sisters, all the angels and saints and Mary and everybody to pray for us that we may correct that. Um, so moral living, Christian moral living, involves forming our consciences, recognizing that we are not the authors of the moral law. God is the author of the moral law. So we need to look to God through prayer, through scripture, through the teachings of the church, through um, people that we know are holy. Our conscience tells us who's holy and who's not holy. I mean, we can... Uh, I remember people, um, um, I remember being in the presence of uh, a person and I was like, wow, that person is so close to Jesus. Everything they do, I see Jesus in them. I mean, it was just amazing. You know, we know that person is holy. That's someone we need to go and ask, what are you doing? What do I need to do? that will help me follow Jesus like you are following Jesus. All right, so um, that's it. With Anybody have questions on Christian moral living? Do we need a quick break or, or do we just go on? Okay, we'll just go on because I don't think we have a lot of time. The second one is the dignity of life. And, um, and before I get started on this one, it's important to understand that this lesson, also with the um, lesson 15 and 16, um, which is a, consist a consistent life ethic and social justice, um, we'll be discussing some very, that can be sensitive, sometimes politically charged, um, controversial subjects, but the goal of these topics in the dignity of life is to be open and honest to the topics presented and then 
and then be open to the applications of the teachings of the church. So our objectives here was to identify the inherent and universal nature of human dignity, recognize that all, especially Christians, are called to protect the rights and dignity of all people. So um, recall several forms of prejudice, um, and there's a distinction sometimes based on race, creed, national origin, uh, gender, sexual preference, age, ability, economic status, all those kind of things, um, there can be, uh, we can have prejudices about that. Sometimes we don't even realize it. Um, and so we need to pray about that. And then recognize also that the dignity of life calls us to treat God's creation with respect. So it's not just about the dignity of the human person, but the dignity of everything that God created. The dignity of life. Um, and so this is the opening scripture, and um, this is from Luke, um, and it's talking about the greatest commandment and then the parable of the Good Samaritan. There was a scholar of the law who stood up to test him and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? He said in reply, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He replied to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But because he wished to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man fell victim to robbers as he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. They stripped and beat him and went off, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road, but when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. Likewise, a Levite came to the place, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion at the sight. He approached the victim, poured oil and wine over his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him to an inn, and cared for him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper with the instruction. Take care of him. If you spend more than what I have given you, I shall repay you on my way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was neighbor to the robber's victim? He answered, the one who treated him with mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. You know, Jesus, in every encounter he met, he's our, he's our example, right? He's on how we should live our life. In every encounter with an individual that was suffering, that needed help, um, whether they were Samaritan, the Samaritan woman at the well, the, um, whether they, how sinful they were, uh, if they came to Jesus, he, the first thing he did was restore their dignity. He, he either touched them, he said something to them, but he, he affirmed their dignity. And, um, and that's how our encounter with every person should be, to affirm their dignity. Um, how do charity and acts of kindness, no matter how small, reflect and contribute to human dignity? Um, Anybody want to share a little bit about someone that maybe took time from their busy life to help you and how that made you feel more like a person, more, you, you, it justified or verified, affirmed your dignity. Anybody want to share a little? Oh, Y'all are talkative. For... <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. You sure? Sure. Thank you. 
in his face frame, you can see with him that you can put the boots on there. Now, where you are, mm -hmm. you can get it. Yeah. I believe, though, that I can get that here. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it wasn't just the money, but it was your expression for God to love him or that I love you because of God affirmed his dignity. So no matter uh, how poor he was, how down he was, how he and how bad he felt, that act of kindness restored his dignity, made him remember that he was made in the image and likeness of God. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, and these are just things to reflect on. I'm not going to ask anybody to say, but can you think of some ways that you and I could be good Samaritans to others? Um, that was an excellent example. Uh, how about reflect on times in our lives where we saw an injured person that was not a member of our family and injured in any kind of way, like economically injured or, or whatever, but um, or physically injured or, or um, and was not a member of our family, community, or culture, did we choose to look the other way? I mean, these are something to reflect on because this is what that reading is calling us to do, to go beyond what our, our maybe initial thoughts or our initial prejudices are um, to, to affirm the dignity of that person and to, and to recognize that that person too is a child of God. Um, all humans have equal dignity and value. God has given us this. God has given us this. Um, if we look around us, though, God did not create us identical, right? We're not, we're not just like robots that were manufactured by um, people. Every single one of us is different. Everyone is diverse, both um, ethnic backgrounds to um, how we grew up, uh, short, tall, bald, you know, we're all different, you know, uh, and we all have, but we all have the same dignity. We all have equal dignity. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter where we came from. It doesn't matter how poor we are or what, what race we are, what ethnicity. We all have equal dignity, and that's that's always important to remember. And remember, Jesus, when we encounter another person, we need to think of that person, too, as a child of God. That person is a child of God. That, that needs to be our mantra. Uh, likewise, not all of us have been given the same spiritual gifts, either. So just like we're all created diverse and, and different, um, We've been given different spiritual gifts. How do we use those gifts? They're meant to bring others closer to God. They're meant so that our actions reflect that we truly are Christians, that we truly love one another, right? Uh, that's that's uh, what those gifts are for, um, for building up the church. And the church is not this building. The church is the people of God. We're called to build up the people of God. Um, you know, race and ethnicity, they go through different um, uh, sections of, of people that have been discriminated based on, on different things. So race and, and, and ethnicity, um, you know, racism is a radical evil that divides the human family. It divides us as a human family. Um, so... As, um, and this is from brothers and sisters to us. It's in the, the online version. As individuals, we should try to influence the attitudes of others by expressly rejecting racial stereotypes, racial slurs, and racial jokes. We should influence the members of our families, especially children, to be sensitive to the authentic human values and cultural contributions of each racial grouping in our country. Because God created us to live together in harmony. Even though we're different, we celebrate the diversity, but we live together in harmony where it fosters unity, growth, enrichment, um, and, and, and oneness, the body of Christ. We become one body. Um, uh, gender, the next 
The topic is gender equality. So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Okay, so um, there's an equality. There's gender diversity, but there's gender um, equality. The, uh, women are not to be made um, inferior to men or superior. Men are not made to be inferior to women or uh, superior. There's, there's an equality. Now, there's attributes and different roles that um, God has, has placed within us, but that doesn't make us less than the other. It's, it's a complementary thing, not a less thing. Okay. Um, they've been created, willed by God to be in perfect equality as human persons. Um, they share one in the same dignity in the image of God. And their being man and their being woman, they reflect God's uh, wisdom and goodness. Um, in no way is God in man's image. God is not in man's image. God made us in his image. Okay, so um, God is neither, neither man nor woman. Um, God is pure spirit, and there's no place for differences between the sexes and, and God. Um, but the perfections of man and, and the perfections of woman reflect something of the infinite perfection of God. Um, so creates us differently distinct genders, only two, by the way, according to the teachings of the church and of God, only two genders, different roles, equal dignity. Okay, um, <clears throat> sexual orientation. Um, so human sexuality is rooted in the natural law and God's design of two complementary genders, male and female. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of confusion in modern society about this topic, but God is the author of life. Again, male and female who created them. Um, we don't get to decide what gender we are. God already created us in a gender. We don't let our children grow up and let them decide what gender they are. We tell them what natural law has created them um, and be. Um, and the, the, as Christians, um, the sexual act becomes a holy act between a man and a woman within the sacramental covenant of marriage. It's a giving of each other totally in a way that affirms their dignity as children of God. It's that bond that strengthens the relationship affirms the other person, never tears it down, never is used against them. It affirms the other person and is open to the prospect of children. This can only happen in a marital, covenantal, sacramental um, relationship. Um, anything outside of that relationship of, um, is, is not of God, is not holy. Um, so um, se any sexual act outside the sacrament of marriage is sinful. And it doesn't matter whether it's a heterosexual couple or a homosexual couple. It's sinful outside of the marital act. Well, um, homosexuals can get married in the United States now. It's not recognized by the church because it does not fit into the natural law of what is meant to be holy between a man and a wife only in the covenantal relationship and in the sacrament of married life. So um, this is very confusing. At the same time, there, people cannot help who they are attracted to. Okay, some people are attracted to people of the like sex, but that doesn't make it, and that in itself is not sinful. To act on that is sinful. To act on anybody that you're attracted to outside of the sacrament of marriage in a sexual manner is sinful. So that's the sinful act. So we're called then to live a life 
of chastity in our state or vocation. So um, if, if, um, if we're married, that, that, that life of chastity is the covenant between each other and, and to be chaste where we don't go outside the mar marital sacrament to other people. Um, but outside of that, single people are called to be chaste in that state of life. So, and homosexuality is in that is in that group as well, just as it is with heterosexual people. It's, it's no difference. It's not picking on them. Um, so let's see. So sexual orientation. Anybody have questions so far in any of this? Because these are hard, tough topics. But. Um, All right, social, socioeconomics. Um, the U.S. bishops teach that economic decisions have moral and social dimensions that either enhance or diminish the human dignity. So every economic decision should be designed to enhance dignity. It should never be designed to diminish it. Um, so, and that means that they need to cover all aspects of this the society in which they're governing. Um, three questions they, the bishops pose to form economic perspectives. What does the economy do for the people? What does it do to the people? And how do the people, how are the people able to participate in that economy? One of the things of economic justice is the ability to be able to participate. When we exclude someone, do not allow them to work for whatever reason and exclude them from participating and providing for their families, that is a threat against their, that is a, a diminishing their dignity. That's taken away uh, their, their freedom and dignity. Okay, the common good. The common good is to be understood as the sum total of all social conditions which allow people either as groups or individuals, to reach their fulfillment more, more fully and more easily. So it presupposes the respect for the person, the social well-being and development of a group or persons, and it requires peace and security. Um, and so in, in the common good of when, when people are making these economic decisions or any decisions, we have to think about how will this affect everyone in the group, leaving no group uh, um, out. And then at the same time, doing it in an environment that's peaceful and secure. And then the last thing was care for creation. You know, God looked in Genesis chapter one, God looked at everything that he had made and found it very good. Um, we are called as Christians to respect our environment, to preserve our envi environment the best that we can, to not throw litter and stuff out on the, on, on the roads as we're driving by, um, and to um, keep that for future generations because God created it and it is very good. Um, I'm almost finished, uh, but things I want us to be thinking about is um, reflect on our own prejudices, biases, assumptions, and insecurities. Almost everyone has them. I'm not, no one's picking on anybody. But first we have to identify them and then in order to change them or change our perspective. How can we weed out that prejudice and labels from my own life? How can I sow seeds that bring life and full appreciation for human dignity? And how, have I ever been a victim of discrimination or um, prejudice? And if I have, how, what can I do to go in the path to forgive the other and then at the same time allow for gentle correction so that way they can see what they're doing is harmful? Okay, so things to think about. And then our closing prayer, I'm going to read from Matthew and, um, and then we'll, we'll say the Our Father together. Um, before I do that, anybody have any questions? I know I just kind of rushed through all of this, but it's a big topic with a lot of stuff, and I wanted to include everything. Any questions or anything? Okay. 
So this is from Matthew chapter 5. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not turn your back on one who wants to borrow. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly Father. For he makes his sun rise on the bad and the good and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brothers only, what is unusual about that? Do not the pagans do the same. So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. And I'd like to, our final Closing prayer will be the Our Father, and we could do that together. Maybe we can all stand for that. So, In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you have any questions or any thoughts, if you want to come up, and I'll be here for a little bit. But I think... The